Very good. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for joining us on a rainy morning, quite early for Washington, D.C., so I'm happy to see everybody here and to welcome Senator John Cornyn, who is the Senate Whip. I'm Fanny Pletka, Vice President of the American Enterprise Institute. Senator Cornyn is, in addition to being the uh, Senate Whip, a member of the Finance Committee and the Judiciary Committee, but we're not here to talk about finance or judiciary or the Senate. We're here to talk a little bit about foreign policy and the challenges that we perceive. Senator had a piece today in the Washington Times in which he outlined some of the concerns uh, that he sees in a really sort of systemic way uh, across the foreign policy challenges that the country is facing right now. Just tell me a little bit about how you see the problem before we get to specific questions. Well, I think you can uh, summarize it by saying we lack a clear plan. We uh, are we lack the capacity to carry out a clear plan, and certainly uh, our credibility is at stake given the red lines that President Obama has drawn uh, that have not proven to be uh, real. So I would think that pretty much summarizes the whole picture for me. Um, lack of a plan, lack of uh, capacity to carry out a plan, and uh, lack of credibility is really the three problems I see with President Obama's uh, foreign policy and with our national security policy today. And what do you see as the outgrowth of, of those three problems mm -hmm. systemically? Well, I think it's pretty obvious we see the bad guys uh, emboldened. Mm -hmm. uh, we see Putin unafraid and undeterred by the sanctions that have been imposed so far. We see Iran continuing to uh, enrich uranium, and uh, not one single centrifuge has been uh, taken down under this uh, interim negotiated agreement. And, but in, and I think one of the best indications that Congress is, feels like uh, the, the administration, particularly drawing red lines on our, the Iranian nuclear threat, is not credible is the fact that uh, there's a sanctions bill that uh, enjoys broad bipartisan support, but Senator Reid, in order to protect the White House, won't allow that to come uh, to the Senate floor. Uh, and we just see, uh, as as uh, DNI, the Director of National Intelligence, has said, a world in which the uh, the risks and the threats to our country have never been greater in his uh, five decades of intelligence uh, experience. You know, I think that this, I think that there's a growing consensus that um, that our foreign policy is is a challenge, and that that we are facing not just problems, obviously, with with Russia, newly newly aggressive. Uh, with the, the continued problem of Syria, with the growth of Al Qaeda, with the Iranian nuclear program. Nobody talks anymore about North Korea, of course, not to speak of China's predations in the South China Sea, the East China Sea, um, the hollowness of the pivot to Asia. So, I mean, I, I think that there's actually a growing consensus, not just among Republican critics of the president's national security policy, but perhaps a little bit more um, uh, quiet and behind closed doors, but also among <coughs> Democrats. Uh, there's a lot of concern uh, about this, but the public still doesn't seem energized to do anything. So uh, Bob Kagan had a very good piece in the Washington Post in which he said, how is it that the public disapproves of the president's foreign policy and still doesn't want to do anything? Well, one of the problems is, of course, that the president needs to talk about it, uh, and he doesn't talk about it. He doesn't identify the threat and talk about what we need to do to respond to the threat. And so it, by and large, doesn't get a lot of public uh, attention. Uh, now, when uh, the tragic circumstances in Nigeria occur where these uh, girls are captured uh, and, uh, you know, gr grabs the public attention, well, you know, it almost, it's almost like we have attention deficit disorder when it comes to our foreign policy and national security. People get wrapped up in this admittedly tragic story, but when you look at the spectrum of threats to America, um, there are many, many very more serious threats to America and our national security. And as we've seen in history, um, mistakes can be made uh, when dangerous uh, circumstances um, occur and uh, people miscalculate and that can lead to um, war, which is cer certainly something we want to avoid. But one way we can do that is by being clear in our plan and where our red lines really are uh, making sure we have the capacity to enforce those red lines and making sure that they're credible. 
So you talked a little bit in your in your article about some of the things that um, that you think we, the president needs to do, and it, that that has been a very typical response from the White House, which is, oh, you, you don't like our foreign policy, you don't think we're tough enough. Okay, what do you want to do? So, you know, what about Syria? What about Ukraine? What what do you think the president should be doing? Well, the president is a master of the, uh, I think they call it the fallacy of the false dichotomy, uh, the false choice. It's either do nothing or it's boots on the ground. When the truth is we have a full range of, of capabilities to uh, help our allies uh, to provide uh, uh, everything from airlift to uh, military equipment to uh, adv technical uh, advice and support. Uh, there's a lot of things we can do and not put boots on the ground that would help in places like Ukraine. And of course, the president overruled his own military advisors in uh, Syria back in the summer of 2012 when they advised uh, him to arm um, some of the Syrian rebels. Admittedly, as time has gone by, that's become much more complicated because it seems to have been the, uh, the, the focal point for all the jihadists and foreign fighters now who are going there because that's where the action is. And admittedly, it's a lot more complicated now, 150,000 people dead uh, roughly later. All right. I, I, again, you know, I have these conversations all the time, as I'm sure you do. Um, the pushback that I get is, oh, you think the president is, uh, you think the president made a, a bad choice that he undercut himself uh, when he uttered that there was a red line uh, and then refused to act. But of course, Congress had this before them. He actually put this question before Congress, which I think he, he did to give himself a pretext right. in the confidence that Congress would not support military action, even if it demanded no boots on the ground. Right. Uh, Con do, you th do you think Congress would have supported the president at that time? Well, the, the, the Congress uh, did not support the president uh, because he didn't really have a plan for the end game in Syria. Uh, he, uh, you know, they sent all sorts of contradictory messages. For example, he said, uh, Secretary Kerry, I believe, said it would, uh, our military strike would be, quote, unbelievably small, uh, as if you won't even notice it. So what's the point? And as we all have learned is once you start a war, and that would be an act of war, no doubt about it, uh, you can't control how it ends. So I think, you know, the president didn't have a credible plan. Uh, he was sending mixed messages about actually what his commitment to uh, that, what the plan that did exist, and there was absolutely nothing, no uh, lesson learned from uh, what we've seen now in Afghanistan and Iraq and places like that, that once you start a war, uh, you pretty well need to think about what happens, uh, how you wind that down and where you want to end. Uh, Secretary Gates, is, in his book, was pretty clear about uh, his criticism of, uh, of our uh, military actions in Afghanistan and Iraq, particularly Iraq. But, you know, war is uh, unpredictable. And um, I, I can't remember who first talked about the, the first thing that happened. All war plans kind of go out the window after the first shot is fired. But the fact is we, we did learn, we should have learned some lessons from Iraq about uh, what we wanted to accomplish and how we would accomplish it once the shooting uh, started. And President Obama appears not to have learned anything from that experience. So I, I want to I talk to you about defense and, and spending, but, but you, you've taken me to Iraq. Um, you, know, it, it, you know how I and many of my colleagues feel about the Iraq war, um, uh, supported it, still believe we did the right thing. But I think there's a, a broad um, sense of trauma still among both foreign policy people, experts, practitioners, policymakers, and in the American public that um, that uh, uh, ask whether any, everything is going to become another Iraq. Uh, every, you know, Syria is going to become another Iraq, and, and, uh, and everything else we do is going to become another Iraq. And the president, of course, is dead, as far away from what's going on on the ground in Iraq as he possibly can. Do you see a lot of the problems that we're facing today as, as blowback from that? Well, I think I think uh, to some extent, people who say that, well, we've got war worry, so we really want to disengage from the rest of the world have learned some of the wrong lessons from Iraq. Uh, to me, the, the lesson we should have learned from Iraq uh, is that it's a mistake to pull the plug on a fragile 
a democracy uh, if, before it's able to stand on its own two legs. And uh, obviously Japan and Germany, where we maintained a military presence after World War II as they transitioned it into democracies that become two of the most uh, uh, successful uh, economic powers and democracies in, in the world. So, you know, I, I agree that the Iraq war, that Saddam Hussein uh, was a threat there, that uh, it is, uh, Iraq's better off uh, today than it was under Saddam Hussein, but the fact of the matter is, and this is the lesson I think we all have learned from Iraq, is that as uh, Ambassador Ryan Crocker pointed out, uh, there were no Nelson Mandela's in Iraq because Saddam killed all of them. And so just as we saw in Egypt with the rise of the Muslim Brotherhood, that uh, d democracy is great, but democracy is more than just having an election, particularly one that might be the very last election that's ever held, because uh, they lack institutions that uh, we take for granted in this country that make for civil society and make for uh, true representative democracy. It's absolutely remarkable. You talk about the lessons learned from Iraq. We see what's going on on the ground. The number of people who are now being killed by terrorists right. in Iraq has escalated dramatically this year. That's not on the front pages. And what else is not on the front pages is Afghanistan. We've got troops on the ground there. The president is right now contemplating, I'd say, a very leaving a very low number of troops there. Um, but Congress hasn't spoken on that matter very, very loudly either. Uh, what kind of consensus do you see in the Congress on on leading on foreign policy? Well, I think I think we uh, after we saw no bilateral security agreement being negotiated in, in Iraq and the consequences of that and America's uh, what I would call precipitous exit uh, from Iraq, leaving it uh, as I said unstable. And now, as you point out, a lot of the same uh, conflicts uh, have arisen that were a challenge for us uh, all along. Hopefully we won't make the same mistake in Afghanistan. I led a congressional delegation to Afghanistan last July, uh, bipartisan, and we were told from the uh, leadership there that really they needed a, a minimum footprint there uh, and below which uh, we shouldn't bother because it was just not enough. So we need to make sure that uh, with uh, President Karzai moving on, uh, hopefully we'll have a more We'll have a, a leader in Afghanistan who will uh, negotiate good faith with us over bilateral security agreement, which is absolutely essential. But then NATO will maintain a presence there and provide that transitional support for Afghan democracy that's so important. Nobody said it, it was going to be easy, um, and uh, it's not. But it's worth doing, particularly after the commitment and the investment we've made in American treasure and blood in both of those countries. Right. No, it is remarkable how you can make those kinds of investments and then turn around and go, never mind. Yeah. Right, never mind. It's, it's scandalous. So um, we have a project here uh, at the American Enterprise Institute uh, called the American Internationalism Project, and it's uh, co-chaired by former Senator Kyle and former Senator Lieberman. Um, they had a piece last week in, uh, in Foreign Policy talking about that uh, much discussed poll, uh, NBC Wall Street Journal poll about America. American isolationism on the rise. And they argued that, in fact, the numbers didn't back that up. That while more Americans uh, say that we should mind our own business, uh, Americans still support being the only superpower, pushing back on China, having a strong role in the world, showing more leadership, and support President Obama actually doing more. And the argument that they made was that, in fact, this is, a, this is something that people in Washington have been saying that the American public doesn't want to do it in order to, in fact, hide behind a public view that doesn't really exist and promote their own uh, disengagement from the world. We've talked about the president, we've talked about foreign policy, uh, uh, but we haven't talked about some on the Republican side. You know, the Republican Party is not immune to certain isolationist trends as well. How do you see that? Well, one of the reasons I was happy to uh, be with you today is to talk about how I think we need to uh, we need to uh, change the tack of our sales as a Republican Party. Uh, it's, you know, both parties have a spectrum of, uh, or a coalition, uh, and certainly we have a coalition in the Republican Party, everything from libertarians to Tea Party to national security hawks to fiscal conservatives to social conservatives, and I'm a little bit of all of those. So, but I think we, we did lose our way to, uh, when we got bogged down in the Budget Control Act and 
focusing solely on uh, controlling discretionary spending, the one-third roughly of spending that Congress can control, the two-thirds of it being on autopilot, which President Obama has shown zero interest in paying attention to. So we did what we could uh, to try to, uh, through, the, through the vehicle, the Budget Control Act and the sequester. But the deal was uh, really one that nobody expected to happen because of the draconian cuts uh, in defense spending, which is about 20% of our federal spending, but it took about 50% of a hit on sequester. So um, while I think it was important to do what we could in, to control discretionary spending, I think we also need to realize that there is one job that only the federal government can do, and one job for which it is mainly constituted, and that is for the common defense. And if we're not doing that job, then we're not doing the most basic job of the federal government. So uh, my hope is that uh, after the next election, uh, when we get back in the budget uh, writing process, something that hadn't happened for many years now, and, and I think we've suffered from a lack of prioritization, um, and at the top of that list should be national defense, that we're in a better position uh, to write that uh, imbalance uh, when it comes to defense spending. But the problem is, as I started out by saying, Danny, is that if we don't have a clear plan, our let's say we spend, as Joe Lieberman liked to say, uh, he, he'd like to uh, enlist us to the 4% caucus, the 4% of GDP. We could spend 4% of GDP, uh, but if we don't have a plan and if we don't ever intend to use that military power, it doesn't make much difference. And I'll just close on this thought. I'm, I'm not sure that uh, a, a congressional committee has ever sent the Pentagon back to school on a quadrennial defense review. Uh, but uh, Buck McKeon, the chairman of the House Armed Services Committee last May, basically told the, told the Defense Department that they didn't meet their statutory responsibilities to, uh, to write a quadrennial defense review that looked out over a 20-year horizon at the threats that might confront the United States and a plan to deal with those. And he pointed out that it was largely budget-driven. In other words, rather than say, <clears throat> here's the mission, here are the, here are the threats, here's the mission, and this is how much it's going to cost, they got it reversed and said, okay, here's how much money we have, and now here's what we're going to do with that money. I think that's backwards, and it, it's uh, symptomatic of the problems we've had, both in Congress and in the uh, White House over the last few years. So I want to talk to you about the mission that you're talking about, and I also want to talk to you about the budgetary process, because I think this is another challenge. We see right now that, that Mr. McKeon, who really has been a very fine chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, um, and very committed to both the men and women of the, of the military and, and the mission. But they're now in a, in a war with the Pentagon over the A-10, over base closure, and uh, so we're watching as, as fixed costs within the Department of Defense are growing. It looks a lot like the, the, the national economy, mm -hmm. in which entitlements, uh, retirement pay, uh, personnel costs, overhead have skyrocketed to almost 50% of the budget, and we're robbing uh, operations, readiness, maintenance, uh, and uh, and new systems in order to pay those fixed costs. And it, it, it seems that there's not a lot of willingness uh, to address those entitlement problems, those <coughs> rises in wages as well, on our side. Well, you're right. It does reflect the problem we have writ large with the overall economy. And, you know, I remember uh, Admiral Mullen, when he was chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff, had said the biggest threat to our national security was our debt. And you don't hear the president or many, much anybody talking about the fact we have a $17 trillion in debt. Admittedly, the Federal Reserve has kept interest rates low, but that's not always going to be the case. And somebody's going to have to pay that money back at much higher rates of interest, which are going to crowd out defense spending, uh, non-defense discretionary spending for the safety net and the like. And you're exactly correct that uh, the Pentagon is beginning to reflect that, that larger problem in the context of national security. But this is what happens when, essentially, for the last five years, we haven't had a budget and uh, thus no, uh, uh, no discipline that goes along with that process. And it is, to me, a matter of priorities, as you point out. Uh, the military uh, doesn't exist for the purpose of paying uh, those uh, those those overhead costs. Uh, the military exists to fight and win our nation's wars and to keep us safe. And so, reestablishing that priority 
and uh, dealing with the, react the hard choices we're going to have to make when it comes to the overhead costs are something that goes with the job, and we ought to be doing, and we haven't been doing it. So one of the things we saw on the substance side, just to talk about sort of resourcing plans and, uh, and having a strategy, an overall strategy, one of the things we saw, ironically, in the last election is that uh, it was a total loser, obviously, to talk about war. It was a total loser <laughs> to talk about uh, Iraq and Afghanistan or 9-11, but it was a winner to talk about China. Uh, and that was quite interesting. So insofar as we were able to persuade both Mr. Romney and President Obama to talk about foreign policy, they were eager to talk about China. Hmm. Now, China has become much more aggressive since then. We see them in the South China Sea. We see them in the East China Sea. We now see them putting up an oil rig in Vietnamese, uh, in the uh, Vietnam's exclusive economic zone. Um, we're meant to be in the midst of a major pivot, or rebalancing, the president now likes to call it, to Asia. Um, how do you see us resourcing that? Do you see that, is, is that a real pivot? I, but certainly our allies in Asia, nor our adversaries, see it that way. Well, I think we, we we're suffering from a surplus of rhetoric and a, a shortage <laughs> of action uh, across the board in this whole area. You know, look, China is a growing, uh, has a growing military. I think last year it's, uh, they publicly acknowledged spending 12.2% more on their uh, defense capability. Clearly, as their interests extend around the world, they're going to try to maintain the uh, capacity to, uh, uh, for a blue water navy and be able to protect uh, those various investments around the world. And of course, there's a lot of history uh, between Japan and China. And this could be a dangerous uh, uh, spark that creates a, a a conflict that nobody really wants, um, but I think you know the president uh, is is again he's uh, got a gift uh, for uh, speaking publicly and his his nobody questions his ability to uh, uh, to to express himself. What he does suffer from is a lack of credibility, uh, and this unfortunately cuts across the board. Not only national security, we've seen it from the promises he's made in Obamacare and other areas that he just doesn't deliver on. And so at some point, people quit paying attention. They quit believing him, so his credibility suffers, and pretty soon they just quit listening altogether. And that's not good, but it's what happens when, uh, when, when, you, when your rhetoric doesn't, isn't matched by your actions. So maybe we ought to return to the days of a little bit of, uh, you know, Teddy Roosevelt, uh, speak softly but carry a big stick. Um, I think there's something to that. Do you see if uh, Republicans, in fact, manage to uh, uh, take back the Senate in November and keep the House, and you're in a senior leadership position, I'm assuming you have a good perspective on this, that they will show that sort of leadership on foreign policy as well as on economic matters? Well, that's, that's uh, one reason I'm happy to be here with you today, because I do think it is time to, to uh, I hate to use the word, hit a reset. Uh, but even for Republicans <laughs> in real Congress, that, that we need to get about the nation's business and prioritize our, uh, our attention to those things that really matter that only the federal government can do. And this is, this is certainly the, at the top of that list. Uh, there are limitations to what Congress can do with an unwilling and uncooperative president. But I think we can continue through the budgetary process and through the uh, armed services committees to uh, send legislation to the president that will, um, I think, reorder um, some of these things in a way that, that uh, makes more sense and challenge him to join us. Uh, this ought to be bipartisan. There should, there's nothing partisan about national security, but unfortunately, um, if he's not willing to lead, then it's going to require more leadership by the Congress, and uh, we're prepared to do that. And when we look forward, do you think there's going to be um, excitement about, uh, about also explaining some of these challenges? Because you, one of the things that I think you know, I agree with you about is that, is that uh, the president doesn't use the bully pulpit to persuade the American public of the importance of this. Um, I, I think that Congress is sort of equally questioning about that. You said rightly and described, I think, very uh, aptly the spectrum that there is out there. Foreign policy is not going to be a big component of the November election, I'm guessing. Uh, well, I think you're probably right. And historically, it, 
domestic issues have, uh, have dominated, and I think that will be true in the midterm election. But this isn't just about campaigning and elections, this is about governing, and uh, those are two different things. And I'm talking now about the uh, priorities we ought to give as a governing party and for the federal government. But you are hearing people like, uh, uh, let's for, for example, Marco Rubio mm -hmm. speak a lot about uh, foreign affairs and national security policy. Um, I think you're gonna hear more of the candidates talking about that. Um, I don't think Americans are comfortable with the fact that America is seen as in retreat and that our role in the world is being diminished. And I, don't, I think it's intuitive and something that is easily explained or uh, uh, that this makes the world more dangerous. And um, you know, we, we've, uh, we've tried to isolate ourselves previously, uh, and not that long ago on 9-11, uh, we were surprised by what happened following uh, uh, the Soviet exit from Afghanistan when that became a failed state and a vacuum created for terrorism, which then was exported to, uh, to our country. And 3,000 Americans lost their lives on that terrible day. So uh, I just think people need to be reminded, and uh, it's gonna take uh, a, the president, it's gonna take, uh, in the absence of the president, it's gonna take members of Congress talking about these issues as much as they can because it uh, certainly uh, is justified based on the importance of the issues. Last question and then I'm gonna open things up to the audience, but I wanted to ask you a little bit about our European allies. Uh, we're always in an awkward position when there's a conflict, uh, especially on, on, on Europe's doorstep. What we're seeing in Ukraine right now is, uh, is something that has even greater implications for Europe, especially on the energy side, uh, than it does for us. Uh, part of the problem that I think a lot of Americans see, and this was true in the Balkans as well, is that the Europeans are willing to talk a lot, but they're not willing to make the investments <coughs> in NATO, and they come, they're, they're turning to us and saying, where are you? Uh, yet they're not willing to step up. Uh, Francois Hollande, the president of France, um, today, uh, I think yesterday actually criticized President Obama for not doing the right thing in Syria, and at the same time, with the stroke of a pen, is selling um, is selling warships to Russia and has refused to cancel this sale. So, you know, when the American people understand that, I think there's a lot of frustration. How do you see this this conundrum? Well, we're not without uh, contradictions ourselves <laughs> when we're buying Mi-17 helicopters. Uh, from Rosso Born Export, the same uh, Russian arms dealer that's exporting arms to Bashar al-Assad. And we've tried to stop that for several years now, uh, and the Pentagon's pushed us back uh, time and time again. But, you know, Senator McCain, uh, uh, in, in his typical way with words, called Russia a gas station masquerading as a country. And I think we need to use all aspects of our uh, power, and one of our great uh, things that's happened to our country is that due to modern uh, technology and innovation, we now have had a renaissance in natural gas and energy in America, making us less dependent on imported energy from abroad. Now, if we could just get the Keystone XL pipeline going, um, we would, uh, we have the potential very in the near term to be North American energy independent. But one of the things we've tried to do is also to convince the administration that let's get the stranglehold that Putin has on Ukraine and Europe when it comes to energy, let's loosen that by um, beginning to make preparation for uh, natural gas exports, LNG exports to uh, non-NATO aligned countries. And uh, we've got legislation that we've uh, introduced on that, to that effect, but so far it appears that the Democratic Party and the Congress is divided on that. They don't like anything that has to do with hydrocarbons, but the fact of the matter is uh, this is a great instrument of American power and influence, and we can alleviate the stranglehold that Putin has on Europe, including places like Ukraine, because he can threaten to cut off their energy supply. So there's a lot of different tools in the toolbox that we could use to help Europe. Uh, Europe needs to help itself, and you're right, it's historically made a rather anemic commitment uh, to NATO, and, uh, but uh, I think America's leadership is the one indispensable element in NATO. We've seen that from the very beginning, and I think that's not going to change. And so while we may try to persuade our allies to change their behavior, uh, 
the most important thing we can do is to change ours and to uh, acknowledge and to retake uh, this leading role in the world that only America can fill. Very nicely said. Why don't I open it up to folks uh, on the floor. If you would be nice enough, I will call on you. If you'd be nice enough to wait for a microphone and identify yourself and put your statement in the form of a question. Um, where is our microphone? Uh, there it is. Would you bring it to the young man there? Hi, Senator Ryan Richardson from the Foreign Policy Initiative. Thank you for speaking today. Uh, you talked about the pivot or rebalance, whatever you want to call it, to Asia. How do you think the nation can better project itself in East Asia to secure our national interests as well as the security of our allies, Japan, Korea, and the Philippines? Well, one of the things that, uh, that I think we should uh, pay more attention to are things like foreign military sales. Uh, we've seen with the, uh, the F-35 uh, that uh, this is a, a partnership we've entered into with other nations and that uh, if we're reluctant, as we understandably are, to, for the United States to put boots on the ground or engage directly, one of the things we can certainly do is to empower our friends and allies to defend themselves and to defend our common interests in places like Asia. Um, but, you know, we've, we've, uh, we've, we've, we're a little bit, uh, our credibility is hurt uh, by, for example, our commitment made to Taiwan. Um, when uh, we now refused, have refused through two, two, uh, uh, two presidents uh, to sell F-16s uh, to uh, Taiwan uh, as part of our agreement with them uh, to provide for their self-defense. So uh, we, we need to show a steadfast commitment because when, when our friends see us as unreliable and our uh, adversaries see a, our, our red lines as not credible, to me, that's a dangerous mix, and it creates a lot of uh, uh, uncertainty. It creates a lot of uh, tension. It creates a lot of danger uh, that we need to try to minimize as much as possible. The the scenario you paint, which is that it, which is that in fact our adversaries judge us not by how we act towards them, but how we act towards our allies, fits perfectly for the Middle East. We Absolutely. didn't talk at all about Israel and the peace process, but and the apartheid state, uh, but. But, but I think that the Arabs also judge us by how we treat what they perceive to be our most important ally in the region. Well, of course, the, the preeminent threat to regional and world sec uh, security is the Iranian nuclear threat. And uh, I have zero confidence that the negotiation that the administration has entered into so far will deter them or stop that. Uh, and of course, uh, Israel is going to defend itself and uh, the question is then what happens, uh, what do we do, what happens after that? <clears throat> so I think by drawing red lines in places like Syria that we're not serious about enforcing, uh, the Iranians look at that and they say, well, if you're not going to do it there, then you won't do it here. And it just creates a much more uh, dangerous uh, situation. <clears throat> Gary? Uh, Senator Gary Schmidt from AEI. Uh, thank you for Gary. coming this morning. Uh, you know, you began your remarks by saying the president doesn't have a plan. Um, but by this time, you know, I'm old enough to remember, you know, things falling apart during the Carter years, um, tensions and problems around the world growing <coughs> up in the late Clinton years. And you saw those two presidents actually change. I mean, you saw them try to, you know, sort of grow in office, so to speak. How do you explain the fact that the president actually, despite the fact that, as you say, the, you know, the world has gotten much more dangerous and there's all these you know, sort of new problems on our doorstep, how do you explain the fact that the president actually has not learned on the job? Um, well, if you explain that to me, Gary, I'm, uh, I'd, be, I'd appreciate it. Well, I mean, let's take it in a non-security context and, and let's just talk about the Simpson-Bowles Commission. You know, again, uh, General, excuse me, uh, Admiral uh, uh, McMullen talked about the debt, and of course you can see where our national security drip policy is driven by budgets and by the dollars available, and now we're on a trajectory to the smallest army uh, that we've had since pre-World War II, um, that the President did have an opportunity in a bipartisan way to deal with this uh, with the Simpson-Bowles Commission that he himself appointed. 
but they came back with a plan and uh, rather than embrace it, rather than give it to Congress, say this is a, a national imperative, we need to deal with this now, uh, he walked away from it. So <clears throat> I just, I think the president uh, thinks that uh, his rhetoric alone is, is a sufficient weapon to deter aggression and uh, I don't know how many times he has to be proven wrong uh, before he'll change his behavior. Uh, but uh, one thing we might not be able to do is change his behavior, but one thing Congress can do is change our behavior. And I think that's why uh, it's important that in November uh, and in January when we pass the next budget that we write this uh, imbalance in the defense spending that uh, Congress continue to do what Buck McKeon has done as chairman of the House Armed Services Committee and insist the Pentagon meet its statutory requirements to come up with a, a QDR, Quadrennial Defense Review, that accurately assesses the risks and, and, uh, and uh, a plan, uh, comes up with a plan to, to, to minimize those risks. And so we need to do what we can do. And, uh, and I think uh, uh, that's, gonna, that's requiring a reassessment now of sort of this, this uh, budget-driven, uh, sequester-driven, uh, budget control act driven policy which I think is is uh, has proven to be uh, uh, unsafe in the long run so I want to push back on you on the budget control act question because of course you you said I think rightly um, that uh, that there was an assumption that you know that, 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 that nobody would pull the trigger with right. the gun pointed to their heads especially because Republicans would not support these very, very drastic cuts, right. uh, almost a trillion dollars over 10 years to the defense budget, and yet they did. Do you see the center of gravity changing? Do you see the folks who, who were willing to support those kind of cuts being in a different position, evolving? Well, of course, the sequester was not an end in itself. As you pointed out, Congress held a gun to its own head and said, don't make me shoot, and then shot. Um, but you know, hopefully people learn and they, uh, and I think one thing that we did learn is that I learned was that uh, that the sequester and budget caps, as important as they are in terms of constraining disc uh, constraining discretionary spending, that there are more important things, and that is to uh, protect our national security. Um, but until we are in a political uh, posture where we can actually deal with things like entitlement reform the 70 percent of federal spending that's on autopilot and where we then we will have basically more flexibility to deal with things like discretionary spending including defense discretionary spending then I think we're going to have to do what we can where we can and that's what I'm talking about here it's uh, it's hard to it's hard to do business with somebody who's unwilling uh, to sit down and try to do business and so far I think President Obama has shown that he's unwilling uh, possibly incapable, but, but probably more likely just unwilling uh, to engage on some of the most important issues, both domestic and uh, national security-wise, that need to be addressed. And he has uh, proven himself to be unwilling uh, to do so. And that's, that's too bad, but that's the facts we have to deal with. So I, I, don't, I don't know the president, but um, I, you do. Uh, I think Gary, the, Gary's question it comes down to an, an interesting, an, an interesting exercise, which is uh, why is why why hasn't there been change? You know, one of the greatest things about when I was on the Hill in the '90s about having a Republican Congress working with Bill Clinton was that you could get Bill Clinton to do stuff. Right. And uh, you know, whether it was because he was distracting from domestic affairs or what, whatever reason it was, you had that situation that really hasn't existed. And I, I wonder, I mean, do you see? this rooted in ideological conviction by the president on national security? Well, I, I agree with you that Barack Obama is no Bill Clinton. <laughs> when it comes to- For good to, then, Bill. When it comes to learning, <laughs> when it comes to learning from uh, uh, elect, you know, elections, uh, I thought in 2010, I mean, to get back to the budget, back to uh, Simpson Bowles, I thought that would be a time when President Obama would say, okay, I get it. Republicans picked up seven seats in the Senate regain the majority in the House, I need to do something differently. Well, he did nothing different. He continued to take, uh, to your point, an ideological approach rather than a pragmatic approach of how do we deal with divided government. 
Uh, Senator McConnell, uh, the Republican leader, soon to be the Republican, or soon to be the majority leader in the United States Senate, I hope, um, likes to say, well, divided government is the best time, maybe it's the only time to do hard things. Because we saw when President Bush, for example, when Republicans controlled both houses and the, and the White House tried to reform Social Security, and it became a partisan issue, and it became impossible. So only when you have divided government can you do hard things. Think about this. Last time we had a balanced budget was with Bill Clinton in the White House and Republican majorities in the House and the Senate. Tip O'Neill and uh, Ronald Reagan famously dealt with uh, you know, extending and protecting Social Security. But if you have an unwilling president and somebody who's unwilling to be uh, chastened uh, by uh, electoral defeats, um, then I think it's a matter of uh, gaining more leverage and extracting what you can. And that's uh, unfortunately, I think, where we're going to be in the last two years of President Obama's presidency. It's going to be very interesting to watch, that's for sure. I thought I saw a question back here, gentlemen. Uh, I'm uh, Tzvitan Shulimanov. I'm a journalist with the Macedonian Information Agency. And sir, you mentioned uh, American leadership in NATO. Uh, I'd like to point out that the uh, expansion of NATO has essentially stopped in the course of this administration since the 2008 uh, uh, Bucharest summit. So at the, uh, the next summit is coming up in September in Wales. I'd like to ask if uh, uh, this is something that uh, you think about when looking into ways to respond to uh, Russian uh, uh, posturing in Eastern Europe. There are a number of qualified candidates like Macedonia and Montenegro, and uh, also mo perhaps more significantly there are countries directly in the path of Russia, like Georgia, who are waiting to start the process of uh, uh, joining uh, the alliance. So uh, the question is, uh, and I, I'm glad you asked, but let me just uh, uh, repeat it for the audience. Um, the question is really about NATO expansion. We've got, uh, uh, NATO expansion has basically halted uh, and m for many reasons, uh, even under the Bush administration, there was an unwillingness to, uh, to for example, grant a, a map process, uh, an accession process to um, accession plan to Georgia. Um, uh, Russia occupies part of Georgian territory right now, but there are other countries that are uh, hopeful, Macedonia uh, and others. Uh, there's a NATO summit that's taking place, not in Russia, but in Wales, uh, in the fall, a and, uh, and there's a question about whether there will be a new willingness to open NATO's arms to other groups in light of Russian activity. Well, I think, it, I think Clearly, um, Mr. Putin views the demise of the Soviet Union and the Soviet and the Russian influence on Europe to be one of the great tragedies in uh, world history. And he's trying to recoup as much of that uh, territory, influence, and power as he possibly can uh, in Georgia uh, a couple of years ago and now in the Crimea and, and Ukraine. And no one knows when or uh, if uh, he will stop. Uh, it's uh, an interesting discussion what there is to, to stop him. Uh, I get the impression that uh, he's playing chess and uh, we're playing checkers, I guess, to use an inapt analogy or a poor analogy. Uh, so, yeah, I think, I think NATO, anything we can do to reinforce NATO, or exp including expanding NATO and its influence to demonstrate our commitment uh, to NATO will uh, be a deterrence. But we also ought to do things like uh, reconsider our position on uh, missile defense, which uh, Putin hates. You remember what uh, uh, with the SDI, the Strategic Defense Initiative, and, and uh, of course people derided uh, Ronald Reagan for this commitment to what they called Star Wars, but then uh, eventually it led to an arms race that uh, bankrupted the Soviet Union, led to the fall of the Berlin Wall, and and uh, world history changed. So I think we need to look at the things that drive Putin crazy, and we need to do more of them, uh, <laughs> is my view. Said. <laughs> uh, let me ask you about missile defense. So one of the things that, that Republicans said when, when they supported uh, missile defense and emplacement of batteries in, um, in countries like Poland and elsewhere was uh, a, a, a strong effort to reassure the Russians, hey, this isn't directed at you. Right. So now that Russia is misbehaving, um, some have suggested that we need to renew our commitment to this, and in fact now it is directed at you. How do you think that? Um, how do you think that works? How do we finesse that? 
Well, I think you're right that uh, missile defense was never directed at the Russians. It was directed at Iran, right. and I think with good reason. And, uh, but Russians seem to have this irrational fear of these defensive systems that, uh, and think that somehow they're going to be uh, transformed into offensive uh, capacity directed at them. Um, you know, we've got a history of trying to negotiate with Russia over arms.